Why are we going over the edentulous anatomy? Am I not going to have that in head and neck anatomy? What does it have to do with dentures? When we can identify the key anatomic landmarks and understand their role with respect to retention, stability, support, ridge preservation, and aesthetics, then we can fabricate dentures that are an integral part of each patient's oral cavity and not just mechanical substitutes. Retention is the resistance to vertical displacement of the denture away from the denture bearing surface during function. Stability, by definition, is the resistance to lateral displacement of the denture during function, and support is the resistance to the vertical forces of occlusion. Various factors are related to the tissue bearing surface that resist or absorbs occlusal loads during function. What factors impact retention, stability, and support? One, the nature of the tissue bearing surface itself. Does the tissue bearing surface have attached or unattached gingiva? The degree of keratinization affects the ability of the tissue to take abuse. Two, bone contours. What's the height and contour of the alveolar ridge? Are tori present or bony prominences? <clears throat> what are the resorption patterns? That is, does the ridge have sharp knife edge ridges or are they nice and large and rounded? Three, muscle attachments. What are the positions of the various frena and their size? What's the floor of the mouth like? What's its contour and where's the mylohyoid attached in relation to the ridge? What about the retromylohyoid space? We use that for retention. Is it sharp and deep? Lastly, tongue position. What does the patient do with his tongue when he's in a relaxed state? What is its posture? In an attempt to understand the difference between functioning with teeth and with no teeth, look at a couple of critical factors. The dentate patient has a periodontal ligament around each tooth root that sends a message to the brain contributing to better function, 45 centimeters square per arch. The edentulous patient has sensory feedback to the brain totaling only 22.96 centimeters square on the maxilla and 12.2 centimeters square on the mandible. The dentate patient can exert masticatory loads of 44 pounds, whereas the edentulous patient can only exert masticatory loads of 13 to 16 pounds. So the function is much more efficient with natural teeth than with a denture. Implants increase the efficiency when placed in conjunction with the complete denture. There is no periodontal ligament, but the stability, retention, and support provided by implants for the prosthesis is dramatic and proportional to the number of implants that are placed. Two physical factors are involved in denture retention. One is maximal extension of the denture base, no ridge runners. Maximum coverage provides a snowshoe effect, which distributes applied forces over as wide of an area as possible and helps stability and retention. Two, maximal intimate contact of the denture base with the basal seat. Muscular forces can be used to increase retention and stability of the dentures. Impression techniques, using muscles like orbicularis oris and the muscles of the tongue and the floor of the mouth, can be used to enhance stability of the denture. The way we design the labial, buccal, lingual, polished surfaces of the dentures and the arch form of the prosthetic teeth on the arches helps balance these forces. We will take a look at the anatomy of the maxillary dentulous arch. When we refer to a complete denture, we often call the area of the denture or the arch by the following names. The area from canine to canine we refer to as the labial area of the denture. The most prominent landmarks of that area being the labial frenum and the incisive papilla which can be seen on the cast. As we go posteriorly, we come to an area where we often find bilateral frena. This area is referred to as the buccal frenum area. Just posterior to the frenum, that area lateral to where the posterior teeth would have been is referred to as the buccal area of the denture. The tuberosity is the prominent landmark 
and that distal buccal area of the denture is given the reference called the tuberosity or distal buccal area. Lastly, the palatal area is the area denoted by the most posterior area of the denture or arch that crosses the palate from hamular notch through or close to foveae palatini to the opposite hamular notch. The diagram shows the relative position of key anatomical landmarks to the maxilla. The incisivus labi superioris blends with the obicularis oris muscle. It is a small muscle and by itself probably would not dislodge a maxillary denture, but its presence as well as levator labi superioris beneath the mucous membrane might present problems associated with flange extension and can affect denture retention in that labial area. The levator anguli oris affects the position of the buccal frenum and can dislodge the denture when it functions. The buccinator muscle originates from the pterygomandibular raphe or ligament. The ligament serves as a junction between the buccinator and the superior constrictor muscle of the pharynx. It goes forward with some fibers inserting into the alveolar process around the mesial of the first premolar and then courses forward to descend into the modiolus or into the cheek. The fibers enter the upper and lower lip, becoming the obicularis oris muscle. The action of the buccinator does not dislodge the denture. The position of the buccinator in the maxilla determines the vertical height of the distal buccal flange of the maxillary denture. It pulls the corners of the mouth laterally and posteriorly. One of its functions is to keep the cheeks taut and prevent the cheek from getting in between the occlusal plane. This can be a problem with the older patient whose muscles lose their tonus. Other pertinent areas of the maxilla are noted on the labeled cast. You should be able to identify these landmarks of the maxilla where important muscles and structures affect denture retention and stability. A frenum attachment has fibrous bands of tissue attached to the bone of the mandible or maxilla and are frequently superficial to muscle attachments. They are ideally placed close to the depth of the vestibule. They may or may not contain significant muscle fibers. A high frenum attachment is when an attachment is close to the crest of the mandibular or maxillary ridge. When this is the case, it may be difficult to get ideal extension of the borders of the denture flange. When the frenum is high, it often requires surgical excision. A low frenum attachment is when fibrous bands of tissue attached to the bone of the maxilla and mandible are placed close to the depth of the vestibule. It is far away from the crest of the ridge, and they do not compromise the strength of the denture. But the denture may need to be contoured around these attachments for retention and stability. The labial frenum is on both the maxilla and the mandible in the position around the midline of the arch. The buccal frenum is a band of tissue located in the position of the canine to first premolar area on either the maxilla or mandible. The vestibule is any portion of the oral cavity that is bounded on one side by teeth, alveolar bone and tissues, and on the other side by lips and or cheeks. The labial vestibule is in the area of the anterior of the maxilla or the mandible. It is bounded on the lingual by the alveolar bone, on the facial by the lips. It is located between the areas where the two canines would have been and is between the buccal frena. The buccal vestibule is that portion of the oral cavity bounded by the alveolar bone, tissue, and teeth on the medial side of the, and by the cheeks on the other side. It is located posterior to the buccal frenum. The significance of this is that the denture flange must extend to the depth of the vestibular fold and fill the vestibule in order to achieve adequate retention. At the same time, it must be fitted to dip in the areas of the frena attachments to avoid muscular activity that would displace the denture. The canine eminence provides a denture support, prevents the denture from rotating, and improves denture stability. It also helps to support the labial tissues that maintain a more youthful appearance for the face. The incisive papillae is a pad of fibrous connective tissue overlying the orifice of the nasopalatine canal. 
pressure in this area will cause disruption of blood flow and impingement on the nasopalatine nerve, causing the patient to complain of pain or burning sensation in the palate. The denture will need to be relieved in this area of the incisive papilla if the patient complains of this burning sensation in the anterior portion of his palate. The tuberosity is an important primary denture support area. It also provides resistance to horizontal movements of the denture. It may consist of a bony area covered by either a thick or a thin layer of fibrous tissue. If the height of this landmark is too low as to interfere with the lower arch, then it will have to be surgically reduced. There must be room to place two to three millimeters of acrylic resin over it without interference with the opposing retromolar pad or denture teeth or flange on the lower denture. The posterior palatal seal area is an area that is usually distal to the junction of the hard and soft palate. It usually passes through the hemular notches posterior to the tuberosities and often passes through foveae palatini. It extends anteriorly through the area of glandular tissue. It varies in shape from patient to patient depending on the palpable glandular tissue. It is used to achieve retention in the posterior aspect of the complete denture. The rugae are raised areas of dense connective tissue in the anterior one-third of the palate. This area helps resist anterior displacement of the denture and is a secondary support area. The hard palate is the area of the maxillary arch indicated by a pink color. It is the primary support area for the upper denture. The hamular notch is a narrow cleft and it extends from the tuberosity to the pterygoid muscles. The pterygomandibular ligament attaches to the pterygoid hamulus, which is a thin curved process at the terminal end of the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone. Capturing the hamular notch in the impression is critical to retention of the maxillary denture. Improper molding in this area could lead to soreness and loss of retention. The posterior palatal seal area is indicated in blue in the posterior palatal area of the cast. The coronoid process of the mandible, shown by the circle on the mandible to the right, affects the width of the flange in the area shown by the bracket on the maxillary cast. The patient is instructed during impression making to open wide, to protrude the mandible, and to move the jaw left and right in lateral movements. The width of the distal buccal flange will then be contoured by the anterior border of the coronoid process. Foveae palatini are two small pits or depressions in the posterior aspect of the palate, one on each side of the midline, at or near the junction of the hard and soft palate. It is significant in that the posterior aspect of the denture passes within a zone of two millimeters either anterior or posterior to these anatomic landmarks. Minor salivary glands are located in the posterior one-third of the palate. These glandular tissues are displaceable. The impression may appear irregular in this area. These glands are displaced by the posterior aspect of the complete denture to provide posterior retention for the denture. The zygomatic arch or zygomatical alveolar crest is an area that is compared to the buccal shelf in the mandible as an area for providing support. The mucosa covering this area, though, is very thin, and even though the bone is in a position for stress bearing, the mucosa is not considered desirable for this purpose. It is poorly keratinized. High keratinization is a characteristic of, the, of tissue that can take forces of mastication. The denture must extend to the depth of the vestibule all through these anatomical landmarks shown by the pink area on this cast if retention is to be achieved. The hard palate consists of two horizontal palatine processes which resist resorption. Because of this resistance, it is one of the primary support areas for the maxillary denture. A palatal shape can be very deep, flat, or V-shaped. A high vault is not conducive to stability and support of the denture due to the underlying inclined planes. 
The V-shaped palatal vault is also a problem for good retention. The median palatal suture extends from the incisive canal to the distal end of the hard palate. It is where the two palatine plates come together at the midline. The area can be quite pronounced or hardly noticeable. The overlying mucosal tissue is tightly attached to the bone, is keratinized, and is very thin. Relief or adjustment is usually required to prevent this area from getting sore. The underlying bone can be dense and often raised, forming a torus palatinus. The greater palatine foramen are orifices of the greater palatine nerve and blood vessels. Relief in this area is not usually required due to the abundance of overlying tissues. They are usually located medial to the third molars. The muscles on this side provide a movable curtain that extends downward and backward from the posterior of the denture into the pharynx. During swallowing, it is raised to close off the nasal pharynx. The posterior extension of the maxillary denture rests on soft palate. The characteristics of the palatal tissue and the activity of the palatine muscles and the contour of the soft palate determine the extent and the contour of the posterior palatal seal portion of the denture. This seal should be in soft palate and not over the palatine bones. This positioning of the posterior extent of the denture is determined by visual examination and by palpation by the dentist. As a general rule, the more acute the angle of attachment of the bone in the soft palate, the less the denture base can extend on the soft palate posteriorly. The tensor velli palatini is a thin, flat, triangular shaped muscle that can influence the denture contours in the hamular notch area. Levator velli palatini is a thick, round muscle that courses downward and medially toward the middle of the soft palate where it interlaces with the same muscle from the opposite side of the midline. This muscle causes the soft palate to be elevated during contraction. It is critical in closing off the oropharynx from the nasopharynx during swallowing and it is important in determination of the position of the vibrating line when working with the posterior palatal seal. The palatal glossus muscle extends from the soft palate to the sides of the tongue. The two contract and draw the tongue and soft palate toward each other, thus closing the fossium during deglutition or swallowing. This also causes lateral pressure on the lingual extensions of the mandibular denture. Of the several pharyngeal muscles, the posterior constrictor is one of the most of interest in complete denture construction. The action of this part of this muscle exerts pressure against the distal extremity of the mandibular denture. Overextension of the denture in this area is very painful to the patient, as the denture will perforate the tissue and create a painful lesion. Patients often experience pain in the ear and see a physician when the problem is overextension of their new denture.